All right, guys, welcome to uh, my first episode of the Seven Day Weekend podcast. Uh, my name is Shane Carling, and what this podcast is about is essentially teaching people um, how to level up in soul set, mindset, and skill set uh, so that every single day can essentially feel like a weekend. You know, when I say weekend, a lot of people think about that as a time where they finally get to be themselves, where they get to be the, the expression of themselves and have fun and freedom and fulfillment and friends and family. But what if every single day of the week could actually be like that for you? And so um, essentially what we're going to do here is uh, today I've got a very special friend, of, a very special guest. His name is Brandon Liu. Brandon Liu is a multiple six-figure online marketer. He's had a ton of success. And um, what I want to do is I'm going to basically bring him on here to, to, to talk with you about the reality of online marketing and living the laptop lifestyle because essentially for the last, I think, three years, Brandon has traveled to numerous countries. Uh, before he even got into online marketing, he was running a pro tennis uh, equipment store, correct? And so Brandon was a lot of, very successful at that. So um, what I want to do, Brandon, is uh, first, you know, thanks for being on, on, the, on the interview here. Yeah, I right. want to ask you, <clears throat> what was it like? First, let's go back. Let's go back. We met in 2013 or 2014, correct? Five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so back then you were running, a, I mean, you were a young guy, right? And you were running a, a tennis store. And why don't you tell us about like what that experience is like for you? Like what made you decide to become an entrepreneur? I know you've got a really, really powerful story. So why don't okay. you uh, share that with everyone? Okay. I'll give you like a quick five minute synopsis of uh, my entrepreneurial journey. So um, I, I grew up in a low income household. My, my parents are both refugees from Vietnam. So as a kid, I saw them struggle and um, it, it's, it was tough because I had a love hate relationship with money. You know, every time I saw my parents argue, it was always about money. Uh, yet it's something that we need to put uh, food on the table. So growing up, it was something that caused a lot of anguish in, in our families and almost tore, tore us apart. Um, and then growing up, um, just because of the people I surrounded myself with, I was really, um, oh, sorry, to take a step back before that, I, uh, I was acting very entrepreneurial since I was about five or six years old. Okay, and the, and the reason why is because my parents could never afford to get me anything. Uh, you remember in school, we used to have scho scholastics and you could order books and all this stuff from school. They could never even afford to get me a $7 book. So I had to figure out how to make seven bucks. So I started selling things to my fellow classmates. I started making things and buying double-sided tape from the dollar store. I was a really good uh, artist. So I drew and I sold stickers for 25 cents, like stuff like that. So I just started making money, wanted to do a car wash and lemonade stand, but my parents didn't let me. So I really wish, you know, they would have encouraged me more as a kid, but um, you know, they kind of crushed that. And then I, had this mindset uh, adopting that mindset of being an employee all the way up until university. Actually, no way. Even in high school, I was like burning CDs and I was just selling it, <laughs> right? Uh, five bucks a pop and then that way I could afford to eat. And then uh, that kind of stopped because I, I had a really difficult time in high school because uh, of family and actually fell into a really deep depression. And then when I hit university, I was like, man, you know, new beginnings, you know, high school, fuck it. Uh, no one's here to judge me. I'm going to make as many friends as possible. I'm going to network like crazy. And then I uh, made a ton of friends, made a lot of connections, made a lot of business friends and ended up going to business school. And the reason why I switched from uh, media arts to business school was because of this one decision I made to follow my mom to Washington, D.C. to visit my uncle for the first time. Never met him. My, my mom's younger brother. So I was 22 at the time. That was 10 years ago. Now, I knew my uncle owned a pretty successful Vietnamese sandwich shop. So if you guys love your bun mei, uh, but when I went there, I was freaking blown away. I was counting how many customers were coming in and out. They're paying $4 a pop and I was doing the math and I'm like, he's gotta be making at least a million, a million five a year in revenue. So when I got back to his really large house, I was like, holy shit, like he's balling out of control, but he's just a regular dude. Doesn't wear any brand name clothes. Doesn't have a nice car, extremely humble gives all his money back to our family in Vietnam to, to support them. And I'm like, this is a solid man. I want to be like him. And then when I went home and I asked him, how much are you doing? He was like, you know, after all expenses, I pay myself about $50,000 a month. 
that was my first exposure to someone I knew directly that was making that kind of money. From that day forward, I knew that it was possible. Wow. So I went on this journey to figure out how to become an entrepreneur. So eventually I essentially switched to business school. I was like almost flunking all my courses, but that year I stopped partying, stopped drinking and I got straight A's and I got into business school and learned marketing. Wow. Um, and then I, I wanted to open up a sandwich shop in Vancouver, but then, uh, and my uncle flew down to just scout locations and stuff. Um, so as I was going to business school, that was a plan. But one day my mom's like, you know what? We're in our uh, mid fifties now we're getting older. You know, I don't want to wake up every single morning at 5 a.m. to bake bread. And besides, the equipment's really uh, dangerous, too. You're, like, you're slicing meat and slicing bread. Very dangerous, right? It's a big operation, and you need a ton of overhead. As well as, like, rent and employees, lots of stuff. So my mom's like, why don't you do this? If you want to be, get into business for yourself, and if you're not going to be a doctor like all Asian parents want you to be, <laughs> then why don't you pursue what you love? So that's when I opened up my tennis shop. Uh, I decided to rent it out of my mom's basement at first and uh, ran it from home for two years, had about 4,000 customers walk in and out, out of that door in two years. Uh, from day one, I was collecting data. So I was collecting their name, email, everything. So that I, cause I knew uh, CRM is one of the most important things when you can follow up with your clients. Mm -hmm. So from day one, had a database of 4,000. Year three, I opened up my sports store cause we outgrew the home. I emailed, uh, sent a newsletter to those 4,000 customers and business was booming, but I had no mentor. And in the retail spaces, it's very competitive. And, uh, you know, I kept on, just made a lot of mistakes without any kind of mentorship. And about seven years later, or five years later, essentially, the business failed. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was very tough because um, I should have just stayed focused with uh, our skill set, which, which, which was stringing tennis rackets. Because I was known, I, I actually strung rackets on tour for the pros. So if I stuck with that, I'd be making six figures a year, for sure, just stringing racket. But I started selling tennis equipment and shoes and just a mess, man. Like a pair of shoes, I got to bring in 12 to 14 sizes. So that's already $1,000 in inventory just for one size run for shoes. So you can just imagine sitting on $200,000 in uh, inventory at any given moment. So I shouldn't have gotten into hard goods. Um, but hey, I missed out on a six-figure opportunity for stringing tennis rackets from home. I think I'd rather be building an online business and traveling the world and making multiple six figures. Uh, and you know, my goal is to make seven figures, obviously. So, so it sounds like you've kind of had entrepreneurialism in your blood, you know, your whole life. Like you've always had that hustle and grind. And I think it became, came from, you know, having a family that just didn't have much. And then you had exposure to gigantic wealth, you know, that uncle who's making 50,000 a month take home. That's, that's not bad. That's not some bad money. And, uh, and then, so you started off and then you started to realize like the, the reality of owning a business, you know, I've heard this said from a lot of my business owner friends is you think you own a business, but then you quickly realize that the business owns you because you're, you're stuck to a location. Um, you've got overhead expenses, et cetera. And essentially most business owners find themselves as the glue that holds everything together. And as soon as you leave, you have a vacation, you go somewhere else, uh, you want to, you know, it, everything can fall apart and it's, it's this nonstop battle. And it sounds like you experienced that. And then, and then, um, so when we started working together, this was 2000, I think what, yeah, 2014, 14, uh, 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, we, we were working with a high ticket health product and uh, I remember meeting with you and then you took that offline and you basically, uh, you know, you ran that like crazy and you were making some, you, like you, you generated a pretty solid um, income for yourself just rocking that while managing the business. But there must have been a pivotal point where you had that line in the sand moment running your business and you're like, man, this is like I'm stuck doing this and there's all this stress and there's all this garbage happening. And then you saw doing high ticket and being singularly focused. And, and so, um, you know, let's, let's talk about what you, you know, your experience from doing um, a location based business to then you went into doing a, a high ticket network marketing company offline and you did extremely well with that. And then you, and ultimately you merged from there into going online. And so 
let's talk about that journey of like what your pain was. Obviously, I think we've established that you had a lot of pain, like overhead costs, a lot of stress, finding customers, getting customers, selling shoes, you know what I mean? Um, and so running your heart, your, your location-based business was painful. And then you did offline and, and you crushed it. So let's talk about what, what made you go from doing mostly offline to doing mostly online. And, uh, and let's talk about that journey. Okay. So I can kind of like go through the giant transition when I was like running my store. Um, I was a prisoner of my own creation, right? I wore every hat in the company. I was overworked. My, uh, like Shane said earlier, my career literally owned me. And then uh, when I started getting into direct sales, when I discovered this high ticket, this amazing high ticket product, um, in the health industry, uh, it actually was in line with already what I was doing because I was already into sports, fitness and health, which is why I opened up the tennis store. I uh, got into this business with the idea of uh, I could probably promote it through my store. But, uh, so, so what I ended up doing was because I saw so much potential in the numbers and because the product actually turned my mom and dad's health literally around. My dad had a lot of colon issues and we turned it around. So uh, at this point I didn't share it with my partners, but I told them, Hey, I need you guys to work the shop because I'm working on something huge right now. Just trust me. So I did. So I went out and I did really, uh, really well in my first few months, made like 10 grand or something like that. And I went back to my partners and I showed them the money and I was like, let's do this. We need to, uh, we need to promote this through the store. But then as I was promoting it through the store, I realized that I'm going back to, you know, having that own me now. They're, like I had to, I, like I was confined again. But where I was happiest was when, when I was out and above and I set my own schedule and I can meet clients whenever I wanted to and I can do whatever the heck I want. When I was on the road, I felt free. But then I knew that there was still yet another level of freedom. What if I can build this online and then work from anywhere in the world? So long story short, I uh, eventually transitioned from the store, building this direct sales business, implementing it in my store, but realizing that really wasn't what I wanted because I, it, was, it was making money for the store just to keep the store alive. And I'm like, that's not good. This is a cancer. I need to, I need to cut out the tumor. So I, I eventually got rid of the store two years into running this direct sales business. It was an executive decision. We took a six-figure loss. So I was six figures in debt. Then I was like, now I have to work my ass off. So the next year I made my first uh, six figure income. I paid off that debt completely by myself, even though I had partners that should have paid for it. I was like, fuck it. I'll pay for it. You guys, um, you guys did me a favor by running my business while I discovered how powerful this online business is. So that was kind of like, that's my Christmas present to you kind of thing. And yeah. then I eventually, uh, three years into doing direct sales after closing the shop, I went online. Um, in Vancouver first for one year before I decided to travel the world. Yeah. Um, because you know, How many countries uh, have you travel been to? the world if you don't have cash flow coming in, right? Yeah. How many countries have you traveled to in the last three years? Honestly, not too many, but I, 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 I'm on a plane a lot. Like I've been to, like I lived last year, I lived in Vietnam for nine months, been to Bali, Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Australia, multiple times, uh, all over the U S uh, but haven't been to Europe yet. So, so you lived in Thailand as well in Bali. <laughs> yeah. So you do a lot of travel. You're just, you, like, you get, you're spending a long time at these locations. Like nine months is, is, is a yeah. really long time. I wouldn't call myself like a nomad in the sense that like I travel from place to place, like twice a month. I more so like to travel and live there for a bit. Yeah. So, because, um, I still got to work. Like I'm, there's some goals to hit in 2020, man. So yeah. So, so let's talk about now we're going to get into it. So thanks for the story. And we built that up just so you guys who are watching or listening, you know, you can understand that um, if you're a business owner, you know, Brandon was a business owner experiencing the same struggles that 99% of business owners experience is that chain around the ankle that uh, the, the stress of the overhead and all that kind of stuff. And so he, we ultimately merged into doing high ticket sales, doing stuff online. Um, and, and now we're going to talk about the reality of online marketing, because when you started doing online, that sounds like 2016, 2017, back then it was a lot easier, wasn't it? To, to do 100%. online marketing. Like, you know, like literally I, I know a guy, he got drunk on a boat and he made a video and he was like, yeah, system making money online. Like it was actually a pretty nice video, but one video just like about the online system, teaching you how to make money, literally made him a million dollars. I mean, so back then, you know, you could, it was like kind of like the, 
the old Western, the cowboy days. You could say a lot more things without having your ad account shut down. And now if, if you're watching this or listening to this and you want to learn about online marketing, you know, now we're going to share the good, the bad, and the ugly, just to give you a real reality check on what it is, what it takes, and, and the trials and tribulations that you actually got to go through. So like on a scale of one to 10 of ease, okay, let's just say 2016, 2017 was like an eight, okay? Where are we at now with, in 2019, 2020, where are we at for uh, ease of making ads work and convert? for your average person who gets on board with, with online marketing? Definitely pull a five. It's, it's, uh, it's not easy. Five. Yeah. It's not easy now. Things have changed for sure. Absolutely. So you have to adapt. So what are the biggest, what are the biggest setbacks and problems that people who are growing businesses in, in high ticket sales on the online space, what are the biggest issues that they're facing? Well, right now when Shane talks about online marketing, I think he's particularly talking about social media advertising and uh, back a, a few years ago, it was a lot easier for sure. Um, you know, the, the, the Facebook algorithm was a lot more favorable for, for the way we run ads. And then all of a sudden there was just an influx of uh, people using the platform. So that obviously increases uh, competition and saturation as well. So uh, over time, the cost of uh, doing uh, like uh, running social media ads, even though it's considerably uh, considered one of the cheapest ways to market, uh, the price like increased by 30 times per cost of acquisition, right? So for entrepreneur, newbie entrepreneurs that um, just getting into the online space and trying to run ads right from the get-go, it's very difficult, very difficult because there is a learning curve. Um, you know, there, there's certain high income skill sets that you have to develop first. You have to have a knack for marketing and sales and copywriting is one of the most important skills in, um, you know, especially social media because it's all about content creation. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, uh, if you're comfortable on video, that's also a very good skill to have as well. Right. And if you don't have those skills, sometimes it's years in the making. Right. So when you come some, some people, they spend a uh, hundred bucks on ads, they get, do a like campaign, they get a bunch of likes and they, they're like, Oh, this is going to work. It feels good. And then when they run an actual ad to generate leads, it, it flops because they, they the copy's off or something's off. Their, their branding's off. Right. So unless you have, the, yeah, unless you've developed the skills to do advertising and um, you got the budget for it, you shouldn't be running ads in the beginning. Um, there's a lot of organic growth strategies that would now in 2020, 2019 would work significantly better. Yeah. So what do you think, like when, what I've seen is that um, a lot of people have these stories in their heads about, you know, a, a, a network marketing. And by the way, yeah, we're, we're talking about doing network marketing through with high ticket sales, doing stuff online. We're talking about like how to make money. Cause we've got people in our, in our teams even that are making 30 to 80,000 per month, obviously income disclaimer. Um, they're not average. They're not typical people. And, and generally speaking, average typical people don't really do a whole lot. So, but systems do work if you work systems, right? Yeah. And so there's no guarantee for anyone else's success. And so, um, but, but there is, there is definitely um, some attributes that separate the people who are having a lot of success from those that don't. And there's skill sets that you can 100% work on. What I find is that a lot of people don't know what those skill sets that they actually truly need to work on are. And they, they try working on too much all at once. And then they end up not being very good at anything. Whereas it's like, like, for example, I heard this, um, this saying once about uh, being, being a, like an Olympic wrestler. You master one move at a time, you know? Like if you're working on an arm bar, you know, you just work on that arm bar till you can get that arm bar happening every single time like this. Uh, don't try doing that plus a takedown, you know what I mean? Like work on one thing. And I find that in the online space, people are trying so many things that they end up, it, it kind of, what I've seen, my own perspective is that a lot of people, their, their marketing attempts are disastrous. It looks like a garage sale. It looks like a yard sale. Everything's all over the map. You know what I mean? And, um, and so, so I think that you're right. A lot of people need to focus on um, the, the, the right tactics 
before they can get to online marketing. You know what I mean? Like it's like you have to get to base camp before you can summit, right? And so base camp is cash flow. Base camp is learning how to do marketing, sales, and, and influencing people. Wouldn't you agree? Right. So, um, and, and then when it comes to duplication, the reality I think is, is what I've seen as well, and maybe you can correct me if, if I'm wrong here, but I think a lot of people, they get into an online marketing education platform or something, and they think that they're going to just make all their money running ads and they're paying for a product. They're paying for education which is, you know, we're now into a couple hundred, few hundred dollars a month of expense, okay? The average person only makes somewhere between, I don't know, 2000 to $5,000 per month from their job, respectively, right? And so then they've got their, their lifestyle, their lives to pay for, and so they might only have a, a budget of 100 to 400 or $500 a month at, at, at a stretch. But what they do is they will try doing a couple ads, they don't understand that there's this long-term compounding effect and that you have to get Facebook, the tracking pixel, there's all the stuff you have to season. There's, there's so many components to it. And I have seen this time and time again, where they blow like a hundred bucks, $200 on ads. They didn't make a billion dollars. And then mentally they kind of opt out and, you know, spending that money and just watching it burn kind of makes them feel a little bit gun shy about spending more money on their card, more money on their card the next month, the next month. And then these, because they're not getting that instant dopamine hit of a sale, right. That they, they start to disengage more and more and more. And so is that, is that what you've seen as well? Yeah, definitely. And, and what Shane meant, uh, talked about that dopamine hit, the thing with high ticket sales is, well, you could get to a point where you're eventually seeing a sale coming in every day. Right. But at the beginning, you might see a sale every month or every two months or every three months, for example, right? However, I was making no money at my store, but the feeling, it felt good because I saw cash coming in every day. But so when you're running a high ticket business, the potential is so much greater, but you have to realize that you don't have that feeling of cash possibly coming in every single day at the beginning. So you have to understand that so you don't get demotivated, right? And then to answer your questions about like, Shane was talking about people spending like 100, uh, 200 bucks a month and they get discouraged. Here's the thing. Okay, with our current high ticket offer right now, our maximum commission you can make um, once you get to that rank is about uh, $4,500, right? Four grand. So um, let's say on average, because there's different products, the average is let's say about $3,000, right? Uh, profit for you. So the thing is like, if you want to get results, you have to be willing to spend at least $3,000 to acquire one paying customer to make that money. So essentially that's your break even point. If you're not willing to go up to that amount for your cost per acquisition, at least in a month, then don't expect a sale in a month. So if your ads performing, then great, you might have a bunch of sales, but if your copy is not uh, off and like your skills aren't there yet, then expect to maybe even spend more than $3,000 to get that sale. When you get really good at it now, now this, now we're talking now you're say, you're spending $300 in ads and you're making three grand. So you're getting a thousand percent return on investment, right? But you got to be good at ads first. But in the beginning, you have to be willing to spend up to your cost, like the maximum cost per acquisition to break even. And, and so that's, and, and again, getting into people's budgets. So life is also happening at the same time as you're building your business. You know, you go out, you blow away too much money on the weekend. A lot of people do that. Okay. Uh, you get hit with an extra bill. There's someone's birthday. A tragedy happens. Um, maybe you got harpooned with some bad behaviors on your own, you know, like, like we get penalized in life, all sorts of things are happening. And so not only do you have to have the right mindset around what it takes to have success eventually online and the consistency and the determination and, and the persistency, right. But you also got to be able to manage life and, and bills and relationships and health and all of this other stuff that's going on. And what I found is consistently across the board is the people who have the most success tend to be just the people who can cope with stuff the best, right? They got good coping mechanisms. And so, you know, what we talk about a lot here at seven day weekend is, is, you know, how to cope with life, how to overcome adversities, the trials, the tribulations, the, the challenges, you know, and, and budgets is huge. You know, most people's budget, like I've in my journey, I've had 
months of fa- of feast and I've had months of famine. I've had seasons of feast and famine. You know, I've had the peaks, I've had the valleys, you know, I've been maxed out on the credit card, you know, and uh, cards, uh, you know, and trying to figure out how to do this because I went too hard over here and tried this thing over here. Like, you know, we're, we're balancing life. And so, so online marketing is absolutely the best way to scale to the masses right where you know you can be spending money if you get your formula down you can be making sales i i i know people personally people actually who are in my team that make sales almost every single day that are high ticket generating them 2 3 4 thousand dollars personally plus they have team sales making them thousands of dollars so it's you know it's it's easy to scale but there's this bridge to gap and that's what i want to talk about is the the bridging the gap you know and and understanding what attraction marketing is you know and that's the bridge to this gap because people would start off in a business and i think too many people get on board with a, a, a product service or opportunity with the story in their brain and you know again you can correct me if i'm wrong they have this story well i don't want to bug my friends and family so they don't bother trying to go for the low-hanging fruit right Meanwhile, those are probably the easiest sales to get, to get cash flow in your pocket. And then there's your whole Facebook, you know, like you can have a total of 5,000 friends on Facebook, yet people don't work on that network themselves. You know, if you have 5,000 friends, that's 5,000 potential leads, 5,000 potential leads. Almost all of the sales I've ever generated have come from literally my Facebook friends. And so I feel like that's one of the, the, the missing pieces here. And, um, and tell me like, what's the duplication like, you know, like if, are you seeing the type of duplication from people who get on board stuck in this online only mindset? Um, what's the duplication like on there? And like, what's the, what's the, what's the ugly part of that situation? Okay. What a lot of people don't know is the duplication is often less than 2%, sometimes even less than 1%. So the thing is like, it's not very duplicatable to learn the skill set. Okay. So the thing is like most people will in network marketing and especially in high ticket sales, the average attrition rate is about 60 to 90 days. So that's the, the time frame that they drop off. So if they don't see results, that means money in the bank in that first 30 to 90 days, they'll likely fail. I did well offline with this business because I saw money coming in on my second month, right? So how do we get people getting out results? Well, if you're trying to teach them online marketing and advertising, it's a high income skill set. There's so many things to learn and there's books to read. You, like you gotta, you gotta train yourself. You gotta go on full on learning mode. Is it possible? Yes. But you have to look at like your development as a marketer on a continuum. How far are you along the line compared to other people that are getting faster results? For me, I could get there quicker. Because I already went to business school. I already understood marketing. I've worked in sales my whole life. But if someone coming in who doesn't have that background, it's almost like they have to start from infancy and try to become good at it mm-hmm. to, to, gener- uh, to have that knowledge, right? So therefore, the average person won't see results in that time frame. And so they kicked the curb. So however, with organic growth strategies and attraction marketing and utilizing your Facebook friends list, man, it's extremely effective. I mean, like if you can't even sell them, how could you sell online? Right. And here's the thing, attraction marketing. I was online attraction marketing, um, using organic growth strategies. I was actually doing attraction marketing before I even realized it. So when I was running my sports store, I was doing attraction marketing without even realizing it. What I did was I told myself, how do I get noticed? How do I be loud in my industry and not have to pay money? Right. How can I have like a, you know, like a mic and just be loud in Vancouver. So people know about my store without having spent any money on, on Google ads or anything like that. Well, how I did that was I know that one of the most powerful form of marketing is word of mouth. And then one of the most powerful forms of marketing online is online word of mouth, which is social media. Well, however, I wasn't big on social media back then. So how do I get loud offline? Well, how do I set myself um, apart from the competition? I realized that um, if I started stringing rackets on tour and promoted myself as a tour level stringer, and I, and I was stringing rackets for guys like Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal and Serena Williams, that I can go back to Vancouver now and promote that. So I did attraction marketing. So I started promoting it and telling my customers and then they did the speaking for me. Yeah. So attraction marketing. 
Yeah, and 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 that's I think one of the biggest pieces that people miss is you know if you if you play that story out that I don't want to bug friends and family and and the whole point of you doing business is to um, get someone to know you, like you, and trust you enough that they would consider working with you because people will buy you before they buy your product or service or opportunity. You're selling yourself. And I, you know, there's a saying, it's a cliche saying, but I think it goes true is how you do one thing shows up in how you do everything. And if you have that disempowering story that you're bugging people, that you're irritating, that you're, you, you, you know, you're a nuisance by telling them about how you can bet, how they can have a better life, then that same energy starts to go out. And so there's some deeper, deeper things to dive into. And, and, and we're definitely going to get, maybe not in this episode, well, but we're definitely going to dive deeper into, you know, how you, how your story, your personal story can either be empowering or disempowering to you. And it shows up in literally absolutely everything in your entire life. Okay. These stories that we create, which were usually borrowed stories from other people who borrowed stories from other people that usually got that story from someone who didn't really have a positive mindset. Right. And so uh, we collect ourselves as these, these com compilations of other people's opinions and stories and all of it's a lie. All of it's totally delusional. And we're, I want to, I want to do a deep dive on breaking that down, but um, so, but let's just kind of sum this up because, you know, this has been good. I, I, I really wanted people to get the understanding on like the reality of online marketing. If you were to say someone, what's a healthy, if they're starting off doing high ticket sales online and they, they, they've got, uh, they want to make some sales, they're, they're paying for education, they're paying for a product. What's an actual healthy budget to start from to invest on ads knowing that it could be two or three or four months before they even see a sale what's a good healthy budget for people to actually start with okay well first of all when if you are very serious about running ads you should minimum give yourself six months to 12 months budgeting so that means six months to 12 months even if you don't make any money do it essentially because you're going on full on learning mode. If, if you don't make any money from it, but you're spending money on ads, it's like paying your tuition fee for college. You're, you're learning, right? But obviously set yourself up and learn as much as possible before you start spending money because otherwise it's gambling, right? Yeah. But um, if, if you are ready to spend ads and you do have the budget for it, it depends on your products and services. You got to do the math and crunch numbers and calculate your cost per acquisition. But for our products, I would say like minimum a thousand bucks a month thousand bucks a month us and if, if our cost per acquisition uh maximum is three thousand dollars then if you're spending a thousand dollars a month you know uh worst case scenario don't expect a sale until your third or fourth month but if your ad's killing it you can see sales beforehand okay the, the types of online marketers that um that i have coached before that are running ads that are killing it still are are now spending like upwards of the ten to twenty thousand dollars a month. Yeah, but so, they're making thirty to eighty or forty, like you know. That's right. They're, they're making they like optimize their ads a month. Yeah. Right. They optimize. They saw their return on investment, and then saw that it was like a, a three to one ratio, four to one ratio, and then uh, they were they weren't putting as much money into ads back then. They saw the numbers. It made sense. They were profitable, and all they did was they created systems to create to handle the, the, the influx and volume if they were to scale, to create automation, put in place systems, uh, outsource, hire people, laid out the foundation first, and then scaled. So that's a, that's a whole thing because let's just say, uh, do you hire someone to run your ads for you? You can, yeah, you can always hire an agency if uh, it's always good to outsource um, and outsource your weaknesses, right? And you, you wanna outsource things you don't like to do. But as an entrepreneur, if you are the type of person that will outsource a great company to do ads for you, obviously expect to pay more because you have to pay people for their services. So you got to budget that in into your cost of acquisition as well. But also, um, even if you're going to outsource at the bare minimum, you should have a general understanding of it or else you could be taken advantage of. Right. Imagine if you're a business owner and you're like, fuck it. I'll just give everything to my accountant at the end of the year. Okay. Not good. Because how do you know that's a good accountant if you don't understand basic accounting, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just an analogy for you guys. So it's a skill set to, to, to acquire, right? Is to understand, number one, 
only outsource something that you at least have enough knowledge on to know that you're not getting screwed. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's important, like online marketing, running ads isn't a strength of mine, but I know enough to know what I need to know so that if I do outsource or hire someone that I could look at the numbers and see whether they're doing a good job or not and see yeah. whether it's worth that time or that or not the time, but whether it's worth the investment because it can be very expensive. Yeah. And so, yeah, as you, as you grow your business, you, you can scale. But again, I would say online marketing is the summit. Attraction marketing is the base camp. You got to get to base camp, learn how to get the money first. 99.9% .9 of people do not have a thousand dollars a month to spend on ads for three, four, five, six, seven, or 12 months. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that online marketing doesn't work. It just means that people who are successful with online marketing have big, massive budgets. You can't compete with them unless you get into the game. The way to get into the game is with cash, lots of money. That's the way it goes. And, and you need to have a realistic mindset around that. But that doesn't mean that you can't make a ton of cash from having 5,000 friends on Facebook doing attraction marketing methods. And so there's, there's ways, there's techniques, there's strategies to do that. And um, actually this week we're, we're going to be coming out with launching something that will really, really help people learn attraction marketing at a really high level. Because again, we have systems that teach online marketing. But you also want to have the ability to do attraction marketing and, and to learn that like there's like literally step-by-step -step strategies that people can follow within 10 to 15 minutes a day that can get you insight in mind, insight in mind. And it's kind of like this. It's, um, it's like being a big fish in a little pond rather than a little minnow in a big sea when it comes to online marketing, right? It's easier to become a local celebrity than it is to try to be, you know, uh, Ty Lopez out there. Okay. Ty Lopez. Remember the here in my garage, you know, like he probably spent millions of dollars on that ad alone to make it go so viral, but it made him very, very successful. But don't forget to even get that ad. He'd spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, probably hundreds or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on so many different ads to get stuff out there. It finally had one that hits. So you are really only one funnel, one con one, one campaign, one ad away from having massive success. But that takes skill and understanding and knowledge and time and a lot of resources to get to. So, so attraction yes. marketing is definitely the ticket. And um, Brandon, I, uh, I, I want to say thanks a lot for, uh, for you know, helping people get more of an understanding. The reality of online marketing, having laptop lifestyle, it is possible. You're living proof of it. You've got a bunch of people in your team who are living proof of it. And, um, and I think, yeah, with the paint the picture, the, the missing gap for a lot of people is simply just learning how to do attraction marketing. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. You got to start organic first, get the money coming in. It makes you feel good as well. Cause all you see is cash flow in not cash flow out. Yeah. And then once you start making that money, uh, so as you're, uh, um, you know, making money in a, uh, by using a our attraction marketing organic strategy, you should on the side, go on learning mode for how to do online marketing later. And, and then later on you can run ads, right? Because, even when you're doing attraction marketing, you still need to have an understanding of con content creation and copywriting, right? So these are all skills that you need to develop anyways. And for attraction marketing as well, getting good on video really helps as well, right? Yeah. So use that as a playground for making money and learning. And then when you're making money, you can kind of like do a hybrid strategy. You're doing both at the same time. Exactly. Right? Yeah, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. No, you got to go step by step by step, guys. And that's how you're going to build a successful business. It is very, very possible. Uh, Brandon, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming on here. Um, looking forward to rocking 2020 out with you, brother. And um, congratulations brother. on all your success. Your Thanks, team bro. is crushing it. Uh, you got people just owning the industry and dominating and uh, really excited, man. And, and a lot of that's because your consistency and, and your persistency as a coach, as a leader, and as a mentor, and as a role model in the industry. So I really appreciate your time, brother. Appreciate you too, man. Okay. Awesome. Have okay. a great day, guys. Bye. You too, man. See you, Shane.